the Greek poet Sappho is a bit of a mystery. Uh, she was wildly popular uh, throughout the ancient Greek world, very well known. Plato called her the tenth muse. Uh, and, and, and her work was very well known, but we only have it in, in little fragments, largely. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it has accumulated over the, uh, over the years. We've had some recent discoveries just, uh, in the last decade and, uh, we're starting to get a decent body of scraps, but they are still largely scraps. So you can't judge her on the same basis as you can with, say, Homer, which is her immediate and, uh, and uh, most obvious uh, counterweight. They were, uh, well, if Homer is a real person, uh, Sappho is almost definitely a real person, but, uh, but she was coming probably roughly a hundred years or so after he was. We know that she was roughly born in around the year 600 on the island of Lesbos, and, um, she seems to have been a uh, fairly, you know, comfortable, aristocratic uh, lady. She may have had a daughter. She may have had a couple of brothers. Um, she may have been married for a little while. Uh, she may have had infamously uh, several love affairs with, uh, with other women. But we really don't know that much at all. Um, culling together a few facts from, uh, from, from poems is always a tricky business, and especially when the poems themselves are so, uh, as I say, uh, scrappy. But what you do have, and sometimes the, uh, the, the fragmentary nature of it really uh, aids in the reading almost, or adds something. What we do have is deeply personal. What we do have is is something remarkably passionate, a voice uh, that is not so common. Um, if, if you are coming from the epic tradition like Homer, she is dealing uh, with very different material. She is coming from a very different place. If you are uh, uh, more of the uh, the political mind, and in, in, and you want to, and you, the poetry that uh, that you're used to is of men and politics and the uh, and and matters of war and commerce and all of this stuff. Uh, she is again something quite different. She is writing almost exclusively of the women's domain, uh, love marriage, uh, sexuality, child rearing. Uh, these are the concerns of, uh, of Sappho. And she is quite uh, heartfelt, it would seem, in, in discussing them. Her, uh, uh, her body of work is slender, but it packs quite the punch. Um, and the, uh, I, again, it, it, it takes an awful lot of inference to draw out some significance from them, but the, the voice that emerges is remarkably, um, distinct. Um, one of the first ones in, uh, in her collection is, uh, Deathless Aphrodite of the Spangled Mind. Child of Zeus who twists lures, I beg you, do not break with hard pains, my O oh lady, my heart. But come here, if ever before you caught my voice far off and listening, left your father's ha golden house and came, yoking your car and fine birds brought you quick sparrows over the black earth, whipping their wings down the sky through midair they arrived. But you, O oh blessed one, smiled in your deathless face and asked what, now again, I have suffered and why, now again, I am calling out and what I want to happen most of all in my crazy heart. Whom should I persuade, now again, to lead you back into her love? Who, O oh Sappho, is, warn is wronging you? For if she flees, soon she will pursue. If she refuses gifts, 
rather she will give them. If she does not love, soon she will love even unwilling. Come to me now, loose me from my heart, loose me from hard care and all my heart longs to accomplish, accomplish. You be my ally. Ah, uh, well, it's, it's, it's a prayer for, uh, for divine assistance in love. Uh, you get the sense that this is someone who, uh, uh, she has had a breakup and she is perhaps a little, uh, feeling a little, uh, angry about that or lost or desperate, um, or perhaps even a little, uh, uh, angry and vengeful. The, uh, the, there is a deep, uh, passion leading uh leading this poem you you can hear the uh the uh the desperation in i beg you do not break with hard part with hard pains oh lady my heart um there she is addressing aphrodite the goddess of love uh, but it could almost be addressing the uh the lady that uh or the person who has left her um it could be it's a little indistinct this is uh, significantly an invocation of uh, aphrodite aphrodite being the goddess of love and sex and uh so she uh, looms large over the uh the work of uh of sappho as opposed to Ares and Zeus and all the uh, all the dude gods who seem to be uh, reigning over the works of, say, Homer, but the um, the the image of Aphrodite as this mighty uh, uh, this mighty power to be invoked um, that is uh, that is significant. Invoked specifically within her realm of being a uh, a goddess of love. Later on, of course, she will be the, mo the mother of Aeneas, and he will invoke her, but that's really more of a son calling for, uh, for mommy's help. Here, she is being specifically called as the, uh, as the authority on love and sexuality. Uh, and, and, and you get that sense of the, uh, the privileging of pains of love. Uh, do not break with hard pains. Hard pains, uh, well, you know, hard pains. Coming in the wake of Homer, that is the obvious uh, com uh, comparison. The, uh, the hard pains of war versus the hard pains of love. Here she is invoking dis uh, divine assistance in uh, warding off the pains of love and the lushness of the language. But come here, if ever before you caught my voice far off and listening left your father's house, gold, your father's golden house, and came yoking your car, and fine birds brought you quick sparrows over the black earth, whipping their wings down the sky through midair. That majestic entrance of the goddess, that, uh, that beautiful imagery of the birds, the, um, the, the deference, per perhaps, uh, of living in her father's golden house, but also the activity of leaving it. This is a society where women have no rights, where women are not supposed to ever leave their father's house. But here, Aphrodite has the power to do that. And so much of this is about power because in this, uh, the poetic voice, Sappho, if you will, is is asking for power. She is asking for Aphrodite to come and give her power because she has been left. She has been, uh, she she has been dumped, perhaps, uh, and and you feel so vulnerable, so weak in those moments. It is a poem of uh, of great weakness, but one that is asking for begging for, out of that weakness, begging for power. And the power to invoke Aphrodite is significant because she is portrayed as this fairly powerful goddess here. Um, she comes in and, and she uh, and Sappho, the, the poet, is, is begging for assistance and Aphrodite makes this grand entrance. Um, after uh, Sappho rather humbly and apologizingly uh, beseeches 
you know, but you, oh blessed one, smiled in your deathless face and asked what now again? Uh, I have suffered and why now again? I am calling out and what I want to happen most, uh, most of all in my crazy heart. Oh, I'm such a woman. I'm so verklempt. I'm just all over the place, you know, and I know and I, uh, I'm sorry. I'm just a mess and I'm sorry. And I'm, oh, I can't do anything right. And I'm sorry. And all of this. And yet Aphrodite comes in and offers power, strength. Whom should I persuade now again to lead you back into her love? Who, O oh Sappho, is wronging you? For if she flees, she will, she will pursue. If she refuses gifts, rather she will give them. If she does not love, soon she will love even unwilling. So Aphrodite says, okay, whatever you want. You want it to happen, it'll happen. You want her back, she'll be back. However you want. If you want her to love you, she will. Even if it's against her will. That's power. And this is Sappho invoking that power, invoking that out of desperation and weakness, but there is that struggle for some ability to control. And when you are feeling vulnerable, when perhaps you have been dumped, you feel very out of control. You feel very weak. And she asked, come to me now, loose me from hard care and all my heart longs to accomplish, accomplish. You be my ally. Ally is a key word here. In, in, in the Greek, I, I think she uses sumachos, which, uh, which is a military term. It means ally, an ally in battle. And that's what she's calling for here. She's calling for a warrior. This is Aphrodite, the warrior goddess of love. She is invoking a, uh, a spirit, a deity of love in a warrior frame, which is an interesting little uh, uh, crossing of the usual distinctions for Aphrodite uh, and it's a uh, it's a puzzle to uh, to try and figure out but it gives you a distinct sense of the um, of, of the complications and nuances involved in Sappho's writing uh, number two another image of uh, lush passion uh, come to me here from Crete to this holy temple to your delightful grove of apple trees where altars smoke with frankincense. Uh, again, just a little fragment, but in that you can see that the lushness of it, the uh, the sensory nature of it, the smell, the um, the delightful grove of apple trees, uh, the 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 sight of it, the smell of it, um, and the religiosity breathing through nature. Um, it's uh, it's just a little snippet. But it has some legs of its own. Some say an army of horsemen, others a host of infantry, others a fleet of ships is the most beautiful thing on the black earth. But I say it's whatever you love. It's perfectly easy to make this clear to everyone, for she who surpassed all in beauty, Helen, left behind her most noble husband and went sailing off to Troy, giving no thought at all to her child or dear parents, but led astray, for, lightly, reminded me now of Anactoria, who is not here. I would rather see her lovely walk than her, than her and her bright sparkling face than the chariots of the Lydians or infantry of arms. Not possible to happen. To pray to share. Unexpected. Obviously, this is uh, this is broken. This is a uh, this is a fragment. Uh, but uh, the 
the the assertion right up at the top some say an army of horsemen or others a host of infantry others a fleet of ships are the most beautiful things on the black earth but i say it's whatever you love so again she's taking that military frame and turning it on its head and saying no love is primary it's not the battles it's not the fighting it's not homer and the epic the epic uh verse of homer and that tradition but rather the most beautiful thing on earth the thing most valued and the topic most suitable for poetry perhaps she's arguing is love and she takes helen she takes the image of Helen, whom in, uh, uh, in whom we see in, let's say, the Odyssey as a kind of uh, uh, tired and embittered old housewife who's trying to shade the past and say, well, you know, I, I know all that stuff happened, but I didn't tell you. Yeah. Um, and she is even more enigmatic in the Iliad. But here, she is not the enemy. Here, she is not a victim. She is not kidnapped. She is not a wanton slut. Here, she is swept away by love. Love is so overpowering that it forces her to leave her noble husband giving no thought at all to her child or to your parents. Love overwhelms. Love is all powerful. But she did it on her own. She is not a victim. She is not kidnapped by Paris. She is not brutalized and driven away by her husband even. She is decided rational even saying no i am swept away by love i am going to do this she leaves she left behind her most noble husband her most noble husband it is her choice it is her action she has agency more feminine power come close to me i pray lady hera and may your graceful form appear you to whom the sons of atreus prayed those glorious kings after they had accomplished many great deeds first at troy then at sea they came to this island but they could not complete their voyage home until they had called on you and zeus the god of suppliants and and thy own lovely child so now be kind and help me too, as in ancient days, holy and beautiful, virgin around to be arrived. More um, heralding of the female goddess figure, uh, this one Hera, uh, who is not the goddess of uh, love, but one of the one of the goddesses. Part of her purview is marriage. Um, and she is the queen of the gods so she is a very powerful figure and she gets primacy in this you could say you know they called on you and zeus the god of suppliants um saying that well no agamemnon and uh and and menelaus uh the sons of atreus when uh when they prayed they prayed to you particularly uh and of course well they threw in zeus at the end too because you know yeah sure yeah yada yada um that is uh a uh, another example of female power and a kind of female power that she is again it's towards the end it's a fragment you can only guess but you can see that she is uh, again beseeching female power perhaps from another position of vulnerability um so now be kind and help me too uh, be kind. Kindness is a virtue associated with women, not with men. Um, but, at, but also she is asking for help or perhaps she is demanding it. Be kind and help me too. You help the guys, you help them. They got home for better or for worse. Help me. Do the, do the divinities listen to women? 
is she making a more pointed case here saying you, you help the men now help me does Olympus hear women's voices the so much is speculation but uh, so much of it in this case is uh, somewhat inspired speculation it is nudging you the poem is nudging you in certain directions oh yeah oh he seems to me equal to gods that man whoever he is who opposite you sits and listens close to your sweet speaking and lovely laughing Oh, it puts the heart in my chest on wings, for when I look at you even a moment, no speaking is left in me. No, tongue breaks and thin fire is racing under skin and in eyes, no sight and drumming fills ears and cold sweat holds me and shaking grips me all greener than grass. I am and dead and almost I seem to me. But all is to be dared because even a person of poverty and then it breaks off whoa uh the jealousy the uh the passion the that intense feeling of seeing someone you love talking and perhaps leaning in maybe flirting a little with someone else and that is just too much to take and the the uh the internal conflict that sappho uh renders here is extraordinary uh no tongue breaks and thin fire is racing under skin thin fire under skin the uh the, the, this is emotion rendered in the physical realm so that we can understand it uh, th this is uh, this is rendered as as sensation as a kind of tingling a thin fire under skin no in ears no sight and drumming fills ears everything else is blocked out everything else is nothing it is just the idea of losing the one you love and it's driving her insane and that passion is so palpable, so, so strong. Uh, the, um, she rewrites a little of, uh, of, of Homer in the Iliad uh, in uh, number 44. Again, really badly damaged. We've only got a couple of uh, little bits of it. Uh, but you can start to eke out what's going on. Cyprus, the herald came. Idaeus, the swift messenger, and the rest of Asia, undying glory. Hector and his companions are bringing the lively-eyed, graceful Andromache from, whole, from holy Thebe and ever-flowing Placia on their ships over the salty sea, along with many golden bracelets and perfumed purple robes, beautifully painted ornaments, and countless silver cups and ivory. And so he spoke. Quickly Hector's dear father rose up and the news spread among his friends in the spacious city. At once the sons of Ilus yoked mules to the smooth running carts, and the whole crowd of women and maidens with ankles climbed on board. The daughters of Priam apart, the young men yoked horses to chariots in great style. Charioteers, like the gods, wholly together, set out to Ilium. The sweet-sounding flute and the cithara mingled in the sound of castanets. Maidens sang a holy song, and a wondrous echo reached to the sky everywhere. In the streets was mixing bowls and drinking cups, myrrh and cassia and frankincense mingled. The older women cried out with joy, and all the men erupted in a high-pitched shout calling on Paeon. Far shooting gods skilled with a lyre, they sang in praise of godlike Hector and Andromache. It's Hector's wedding. Hector and Andromache. That's what's being celebrated in this poem. Not all the stuff that comes after. Not the stuff of the Iliad. Not the battles. Not Hector the great warrior. This is their wedding. 
and you see the joy and it's centered in that female world that world where the older women cried out with joy and all the men erupted in a high-pitched shout so the women lead that sentence they lead that line and the men uh, uh, the men erupted in a high-pitched shout not very burly or masculine war cry stuff here um, the uh, the the passion, all the clinking of the glasses everywhere, the, uh, well, not glasses, but that, that sense of celebration, of a particularly female celebration, a particularly uh, a female centered ceremony. These are, uh, these are uh, the events of poetry as well, she is asserting. These are worthy of poetry. These are not the war cry and the battle and stuff like that. This is a different but not less um, realm of celebration. Um, some of the shorter lines. Love shook my heart like a mountain wind falling on oaks. A uh, great physicalization of emotion. Uh, you came and I was longing for you. You cooled my heart burning with desire. Ooh, again, heart burning. Physicalization. I don't know what I should do. There are two minds in me. A sense of uh, the dualism again, the, the indecision. Two minds. Uh, okay, it's kind of a cliche now. But was it then? I'm not so sure. But that sense of being divided and conflicted and internal conflict, especially um, the, the, the great richness within the human heart. But when you die, you will lie there and there will be no memory of you nor longing for you after, for you have no share in the roses of Piera. But you will wander unseen in the house of Hades, flying about among the shadowy dead. Now there's a different passion. There's a kind of, uh, a, it's a poet's curse, essentially. It's a, uh, a passion of uh, anger, uh, perhaps vindictiveness, I don't know. But here is the poet uh, saying, okay, you know, you're gonna die and no one's gonna remember who you are. But the people I'm writing about will live on in my words for uh, millennia as they have. Um, this is a very common poet's uh, pose here. The, uh, the poet as uh, the, the creator god, if you will, who can, uh, who can grant a kind of immortality. But here she's turning it against someone and you can hear like, wow, this is, this is angry. This is pointed. Uh, this is, uh, this is someone with, um, very sharp feelings, very deep passions, and those passions include anger, and she's willing to uh, immortalize that as well uh, and by basically just blowing this person into the dustbin of history and saying, no, nobody's going to care that you're dead. Now, is this a former lover? Maybe. Uh, the anger is not, uh, not unreasonable there, perhaps. Uh, the sense of resentment, the sense of betrayal uh, that can come up in those things can certainly spawn these sorts of feelings. But the, um, uh, the, the actual identity doesn't really matter because what's really observable there is the poet and the, uh, the, the emotion on that end of it, not so much the object of it. Um, the, uh, the sense of her as she ages, uh, or of the poet as she ages, is uh, significant as well because we don't know how long she lived or whatever, but she does chart some uh, evolution. Uh, number 58, again in fragments, I pray, now a festival, under the earth, having a gift of honor, as I am now on the earth, taking the sweet sounding lyre, I sing to the reed pipe, fleeing, was bitten, gives success to the mouth, beautiful girls of the, of the violet laden muses, children, 
the sweet sounding lyre, dear to song, my skin once soft is wrinkled now, my hair once black is turned white, my heart has become heavy, my knees that once danced nimbly like fawns cannot carry me. How often I lament these things, but what can be done? No one who is human can escape old age. They say that rosy-armed dawn once took Pithonus, beautiful and young, carrying him to the ends of the earth, but in time gray old age still found him, even though he had an immortal wife, imagines, might give. I love the pleasures of life, and this to me. Love has given me the brightness and beauty of the sun. She recognizes that things are slowing down. Uh, the poet is giving an image of, uh, of uh, the end of life, perhaps. Uh, the physical uh, torments that come, the, uh, the knees that uh, cannot carry me, even though they once danced nimbly like fawns, another great nature imagery there. Uh, the, the, perhaps this is being said at a, uh, at a funeral, because there's a reference to under the earth and the statement soon thereafter that as I am on the earth. So there's that sense of, well, okay, somebody's under there. I'm still here, but I'm thinking about under there. Uh, the, uh, everybody has to do it. Even, you know, even the, uh, those uh, beloved of the gods have, uh, have to face their mortality. Um, but that ending line, I love the pleasures of life, and this to me, love has given me the brightness and beauty of the sun, the pleasures of life. And that's really what you get from Sappho. That's really what her poetry is all about. Uh, the pleasures of life. Yeah, the pain when that pleasure is removed, but the pleasure is primary primary. The pain comes only after the pleasure. You don't know the pain until you've had the pleasure. So pleasure is underneath everything that she's writing about. And again, it is in this part of the female domain, the realm of feminin femininity. It's not war. It's not politics. It's not commerce. It's not competition in any sense, which is all over Homer and the others. Here it's simply the little joys, the little moments of happiness. The uh, the sense of joy. 